Yeah, I'm a bit nervous. I'm a lot nervous, actually. But yeah, um, so 16 years is a long time in recovery. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think uh, if I remember an earlier recovery, you know, I'd used to look at people with clean time and think, bloody hell, how the hell did they get there, you know? But I also, I used to put uh, old timers and I'm not calling myself an old timer. I just have some clean time behind my name. Um, <clears throat> I used to look up to them and like almost put them on a pedestal, you know. And yeah, I don't know. It's a disease of perception, I suppose. So, but what I've come to learn is, I'm just an addict. First, I'm an addict. Second, I'm human. And this disease does not miraculously leave my body. I've got to consistently put in the work and maintain my recovery. If I want this life that I have today, that's what I have to do. But <clears throat> as powerful as this disease is, like I've, I've suffered with complacency over recent years. And complacency is extremely dangerous. And, and I see why, because, you know, I've practiced a little bit of it. <laughs> and, and not like willingly, you know, I start getting clever again. I think that I know what's good for me again. You know, uh, I've got this clean time behind my name. I've got this and that, and I'm studying, and I've, I'm in a relationship, and blah, blah, blah. And I've got enough money to buy a flat, you know? And, okay, cool. So, let me be normal. Uh, let me not go to that many meetings and not practice this program and maybe one meeting a week and that's how and that's how complacency works and that's what happened to me you know so I guess my point is that I need to I needed to try and find the willingness to to get back to meetings and to put recovery first in my life, again. And what happened for me about seven years ago is that I started studying law part-time. So I was working full-time, studying part-time, and that's kind of when I got involved in a, in a relationship, and also when I started getting clever again, you know? And then you know, I knew what was good for me. And this past weekend, I went to the other fellowships convention, the National Regional Convention, and I hadn't been for seven years. The last convention I was at was in 2016. And I went against my head. Not many people from Durban were going. They had like five sleeper, two sleeper, four sleeper bedrooms. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to go into a four sleeper room. I don't know these people. What happens if I land up with men in my room? What happens if, you know, what kind of people I'm going to land up sharing a room with? But like I put my recovery first, and I know what convention does for me. It, 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 it recharges my recovery battery. You know, it makes me feel connected again. Because out there, I don't feel like I belong. I never have felt like I belong. I don't even feel like I belong in my own family. That's my, the core of who I am. I don't feel like I belong ever. But in these rooms, I feel like I belong. So when I went there this weekend, even though I was sharing a room with people that I don't know, they were super friendly because they're in fellowship and they're practicing these principles, you know. And um, the other chap that was in the room, there were three other women and one chap, and, and he was out of his comfort zone, you know. <laughs> so we, we were all in it together, I suppose. And I had a really good, a good time. But the insight that came to me was that all these years I thought that I wanted to be normal. And I've been struggling for a couple of years now, you know, struggling with this whole perception of wanting to be normal. And what I got was a deeper acceptance of, I'm an addict, this is where I belong. This is where I'm the happiest in my life. And um, yeah, it was amazing. 
the shares were amazing, uh, and, and why I'm harping on about this convention is because I heard a really powerful message. I was in a women's meeting, and this lady is from the US, I don't know, 25 something years, clean, and, and she was sharing her story, and it was so powerful, and the room was full of women, and it was, whatever she spoke about seemed to relate, someone in the room was relating to whatever, and we were all like in tears, a lot of us were in tears. It was just such a powerful share, um, you know, and connecting with those those parts of us that we feel like we need to deal with alone, and the, in the realization that we are not alone in our in our struggles. And then she went on to say that in America, when one of their members passes away, not from the disease of addiction, just from natural causes, but is in recovery, right? They bury them with a medallion. It's an infinity medallion. And they put it on them in their casket. And I was like, wow. Like, that's what I want to call myself. I want to be in recovery right to the end. Of course, I can't, like, project. But what I can do is one day at a time just put this my, my program first. So, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Also, um, I suppose I'll be brutally honest, last night I was faced with my drug of choice and it was in my car and um, my family member used in my car and I didn't know it and I only found it like last night. So I'm feeling a little bit uh, vulnerable, you know, and realizing that I am powerless and I have to do, pick up the phone, speak to my sponsor and do all the things that I need to do because I don't want to test the waters. Um, that's, that stuff made my life hell, and I don't want to go back there, that's what I know for sure. So yeah, I guess um, that's what I wanted to start off with. Um, so I have a younger brother, um, not too much younger, and he's an addict as well, in and out of recovery, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Over and over, it's like a stuck record, smashing my head against the wall with my brother. Anyway, I'm really frustrated with them at the moment. And yeah, like we grew up in a really dysfunctional family, uh, generational alcoholism. Uh, great great grandparents were alcoholics, my grandmother was like, all three of us went to the same treatment center. My grandmother, my brother, and myself we went to the same rehab. And yeah, you know, even though my parents weren't alcoholic or what have you, that dysfunction still travels down, you know, we still pass it on to our, you know, our kids, me being one of them. And um, yeah, so my mom left my dad for another man who lived down the road. And then that guy's ex wife ended up marrying my dad. So it was like the Queens were a big swap. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this guy was a really mean piece of work, and uh, yeah, like what I've learned is <coughs> that my relationships, I rehearsed my childhood and my relationships, and I grew up with a man like that, and that's the kind of man I attract. So there's a little more to the journey that meets the art that I've still got to work on, but we'll, we'll save it for another day. And yeah, so... That was like the beginning of our foundation, uh, my foundation, was the dysfunction, the infidelity, infidelity porn, I was exposed to porn quite early on, um, my, my mom tried to not let us go into the lounge, and of course I ran out the back door, ran around the house and looked through the window, so I was like, I don't know how old, but little, and I was exposed to porn. You know, um, the other weird stuff. There was other weird stuff going on, and uh, domestic violence, and the next door neighbor abused me. You know, my stepdad used to exchange porn with this asshole, and I only found that out last year. I digress. So that was the foundation of my life, and that's what I used on. That was my excuse. I would use because I was in this much pain and I had a license and I was in victim mode. 100% I was abused so I can do that. I can behave badly, you know, that whole that whole story. And um, and that's what I did, you know. Life did get better when my grandparents, you know, confronted my mom 
and gave her an ultimatum and told her, if you don't leave this guy, we're taking the kids away. And so she left. But she had another relationship with her um, as well. And yeah, so life got better for a while and then I went into high school and that's when peer pressure, that whole thing of my perception, thinking that people who were drinking and using and smoking and dressing a certain way and going to under 18 clubs, like, I want to be cool like that. <laughs> Terminally hip and fatally cool, the saying goes. And that's where it started from me. Um, progression was slow. It was slow until sure, I was about 22 years old and I got into a relationship, six and a half or seven year relationship, I don't know the exact timeline, and we used together. And all, him and all his friends he used <coughs> and we used to hang out and the progression was, like it was quite quick, but uh, quicker than I had ever experienced before. And then the friends started falling away. It was just me and him, and we would use. And we were using a certain type of joke, then we were using something else, and then, you know, got onto that last. People call it drug of choice. I didn't have a choice then. I didn't want to use that. I thought it was the scummiest thing under the sun. I swore my boyfriend, my ex at the time, and his friend, I swore them to secrecy, you know. Um, my brother was hooked on the stuff and in and out of rehabs and all sorts. And, and, and I really did not want to use it. But half an hour later, I ended up using it. You know? So that's why I call it like, my, choi my, my drug of no choice. Because I don't feel like I chose it. It chose me. So yeah, like, um, it took me about a year to, to get into treatment. Uh, into the 28 day rehabilitation center, life skills, you know, the drill. Um, and like when I started using that stuff, six months, I, I didn't want to use it ever again, so I didn't for six months. And then my mom got sick with breast cancer and like, all this other drama was going on. My brother was being arrested and my stepdad, my third stepdad now, had um, a, a stroke and like I couldn't handle it and I, I wanted to stop using and so I was on all sorts of medication and tranquilizers and uh, medication to help me to stop using and I was a mess. I was a mess. Absolute mess. It was like terminal roller coaster. It gives me anxiety just talking about it. So yeah, um, eventually I got my butt into treatment and um, yeah, I, uh, I found a fellowship through HMO meetings. And uh, in the rehab that I was in, I only had one night a week of like aftercare, they called it. And I knew I needed more than just one meeting a week because I used to have to wake up and use just to be normal every single day. So it was pretty clear to me that I needed, I needed a meeting every single day. And this, the message, you know, came to me. Thankfully, the first night uh, that H and I came in was two ladies, and this woman shared her, my biggest secret of my life. And uh, she shared it in a room for the people that she didn't even know. And I wanted that freedom, and that's how I got the message, you know, just from her being honest. So yeah, um, as soon as I got out of treatment, I went to, to a meeting and I clung to these meetings. I was fearful, um, whew, I had huge amounts of shame and guilt and horrible buckets full of sludgy remorse. Because remorse is the most horrible feeling that I've ever experienced. Remorse. And I hid myself because I was ashamed. And I clung onto, onto uh, uh, the program, the people in the fellowship I went to. Luckily enough, I didn't lose my job. Um, I went back to work on the Monday after I got out of the rehab. Um, they, it was like my one chance, you know. <clears throat> I had had an intervention, they put me in rehab. And yeah, so I had to sign a letter that they could do tests whenever they pleased, and yeah, 
I had to go to work every day. Then I learned about step nine, uh, indirect means, so I have to go to work every day. Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. <laughs> yeah, I learned that very early on in recovery. Uh, but someone told me, you have to go to work every day. Oh. So I can't pull a sickie on a Monday. And I'm like, yeah. So yeah, you know, my mom had um, passed away. I don't know why I'm having a this <coughs> My mom passed away when I was in rehab. And uh, my best friend got married when I was in rehab. And I had to step down to being a bridesmaid. And I've got quite a few aunties and they're all around, you know, around my mom. Um, when my mom was dying of cancer. And then my best friend from New Zealand was in Durban because my other best friend was getting married. So like everyone was around and they put me away. <laughs> Let's just move her out of the way. She's a problem. Like, you know, life was going on. These, um, these like really painful things and really joyous, joyous occasions were going on and Kate was doing that. So yeah, it was, it was tough, and uh, getting into the rooms, yeah, I just clung on to everybody, made friends very quickly, I didn't want to be around people outside of the fellowship, that's the last thing I wanted to do, and um, quickly learned about you know, people, places and things, so hungry, angry, lonely, tired, and I still battle with being hungry, and I still battle with being tired. I'm like a child. <laughs> I have tantrums when I'm hungry and uh, yeah, I'm super grumpy when I'm tired. So I just, yeah, I'm just not fit for social gatherings when I'm, in, when I'm hungry or tired. <laughs> so yeah, I've got to look after myself, you know. And I had a really huge craving in the first couple of weeks that I was out of rehab and I was at work and I'm overcompensating at work. So I didn't eat until like after 12 o'clock, but I had a massive, a massive craving and was like reduced to tears. Thankfully, I picked up the phone and I reached out to someone and I said, I, you know, I'm like, I've got a craving, it's so hard right now. And what happened was just sharing that with someone kind of dissipated that craving itself. It's like, you know, a problem a shared is a problem halved and it, it worked for me. And then someone else at work had to calm me down and have you eaten yet? I'm like, no, I haven't eaten. And so, so yeah, I learned very early on that I need to eat properly and I need to sleep and uh, I need to take care of myself, you know. <coughs> so yeah, um, I got this. I got a sponsor. I had a few sponsors. Got stuck in, stuck on step six. For a very long time, I was deep in city. I started the 12 steps when I was around about six months clean, properly. I had a sponsor and, and, and she relapsed when I was six months clean. And then I got another sponsor. Even though I did like five questions, I restarted step one. And yeah, uh, it took me a long time to do all 12 steps. Uh, I earned the nickname Procrastinate. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, and I just, I guess, I just stuck to it, you know, for the first two or three years, I didn't, Friday nights were very difficult, and I made sure I was at a, I was at a Friday night meeting every, every week. Um, I don't know, I was well, like two years clean or something, and I was driving down Musgrave Road, and I, and I hadn't gone to the meeting, I'd gone to a family, like, dinner thing. And, and this like euphoric recall came back and I was like, oh shit, I'm in danger. This is why I go to a meeting on Friday night, you know? So yeah, um, yeah, recovery has been painful and it's been incredibly rewarding. Rewards that I would never have experienced had I not gotten clean. Um, things that I've done that I would never have done if I had not gotten clean and stayed clean. I um, yeah, I managed to 
in that job that I went back to after Reno. I stayed for a couple a couple more years there and you know when as a kid I always thought I was separate and apart but apart from I didn't feel like I, I gelled my mom cut my hair short like a boy I don't like short hair um, I got a huge hang up about that <laughs> um, yeah and I just I didn't feel like a part of and I, and I got kicked back in the class too and I believed that I was stupid you know and at, the, at this job that I was in, they had some cognitive development course, long story short. We did this aptitude testing and my results came back that my job performance, my job description, and something else, I can't remember, all contradicted themselves. Oh, my results of my actual aptitude testing, wow. They all contradicted themselves. And the conclusion was, that I have really low self-esteem. And that's when I started learning, well, that's where I started believing that maybe I'm not as dumb as I think I am. And thankfully I kept that job because I was still in recovery. I was like three or, three or four years clean by then. And around six years clean, I decided, you know, with jobs, I'm trying to just skim over some of the details because it's a long story. <laughs> So, like, I, I went to a different job in law and I decided, well, I keep landing up in legal work, so let me study law, because I didn't know what the hell I was going to study out, out of school, and my mom was a single mom, school teacher, and she didn't have the money for, you know, an addict of my type to go and waste her money at the university. So, so yeah, like, I decided to study law. Um, and it took me seven years to finish the degree. But the catch is that when I was phoning around all the universities to find out if they had uh, um, part-time programs, because I needed to, to study part-time, I couldn't afford not to work, I had to work, you know. Um, and UKZA were like, were like, oh, we have, we have a six-year part-time program. And that split second, my thing was, like, oh, I finished with 12 steps in six years, so I could do this. You know? And that was the <laughs> basis on which I made the decision. <laughs> was like, okay, I can persevere through six years of the steps, I can persevere through this degree, and that's what I did. And um, thankfully, the degree, I think, was part of God's will, really, because, you know, they say if you put anything ahead of your recovery, you'll lose it. And because I was studying and doing lectures at night, like three or four times a week, it was rough and I, and I wasn't able to get to meetings as much as I used to, you know. But it was the relationship that I put ahead of my recovery. Yes, and that relationship screwed me up. Kicked me right in the teeth. And uh, caused me a lot of pain. I, my eyes are wide open now. Yeah, and it showed me that I have more healing to do. I'm like, really? So yeah, I have more steps that I need to work. Um, I have, I think it's adult, adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families. And that fellowship acknowledges our fellowships. They don't they have different traditions. They acknowledge, you know, AA and, and all that. And yeah, that's where I need to be, but I just don't have the willingness to go there yet. But yeah, it's, you know, it's all, all in time, it will come all in time. So yeah, so I studied law and, and last year uh, I finished my degree. And it was the second most important thing in my life. <laughs> Because it showed me that I'm not done. I mean, who the hell would have thought that I'd be studying law and, and be a lawyer in recovery? Like, <clears throat> it hasn't quite sunk in, sunk in to, 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 uh, into my heart to believe in myself yet. 
you know? It's still like unbelievable to me that I've been able to do this. It was hard. It was very hard. Um, I remember on my WhatsApp status it says, perseverance is an act of war. And it is. <laughs> and I'm living proof. And boy did I let it crawl through that perseverance. But there was an acceptance. Um, there was a deep acceptance of what I was signing up for and the hard work that I needed to do. And it was the same stuff that I learned from the 12 steps. And I knew I was going to just go through these valleys. Year after year, just go through the valley to get past this stuff, to do the hard work, maintain you know, my work, my studies, my recovery. And, and, and the past seven years finishing that degree, it was, it was hard work. And I sure as hell don't want to do it again, but like, it's, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Huge gratitude, you know? Huge gratitude. I went to Thailand to visit a friend in recovery in December. I went with uh, two other friends in recovery because um, I'm too scared to travel on my own. <laughs> That's the actual truth. And, um, and I celebrated, you know, the end of my degree and the end of stress, you know, and working full time and studying part time. And then uh, I, I became a candidate attorney. So this year, um, um, I'm doing my articles. I had to take a massive pay cut, huge pay cut. Um, it's a huge sacrifice, but in, you know, let's just say I had these lessons in my recovery and then it prepares me for something else. So I'll explain in more detail financially, like, some years back, I was living in my mom's flat, and when she died, the insurance paid out, so it was a paid-off flat. I didn't have to pay anything to live there, you know, only rates and, and lights and water. And so it was, like, really cheap to live there. And my aunt decided that she wanted to put me in a different flat, and then she would pay for me. And what happened for me was that I felt like she had taken something away from me because she was paying for me, I felt like, like I didn't have that same drive that I had before, you know, to do well in my life, to strive, to do better and all that stuff. Anyway, so I knew that that money doesn't belong to me, it's her, my aunt's family, that's their money and like after a year she couldn't pay, she stopped paying for my rent. And I knew it was coming and what I had to do was I had to cut down on my budget and I had to ask for help at work. And um, yeah, I, um, it was huge and I had to stop paying my own rent because I wasn't staying in my mom's flat anymore. And that's what I did. And uh, I couldn't have the STD anymore and I couldn't have that nice cell phone that I get every two years, upgrade, you know, all that stuff. Like I had to trim my budget down and I had to and focus on like make sure I've got petrol in my car to get to meetings, make sure I've got food and cigarettes. Back then I was still smoking cigarettes. And, and yeah, so, and it's happened through my recovery, that was about 2015 that that happened. That I, had, I needed that lesson to learn how to trim my budget. Which led me to this, you know, to my finishing my degree and, and doing articles. And I've had to trim my budget. And I've... Yeah, it's just insane, the lessons that I've learned in this whole process. And to take care of myself and like, because I placed so much importance on outside things, socially, I need to look a certain way, I need to dress a certain way, I need to have certain money, you know, all that stuff. 
and I've and I've had to let go of that because I I can't afford it. <laughs> and um, and yeah, and, and it's okay, and it's a sacrifice. I just hope those memes are all uh, true, you know. With with great sacrifice comes great reward. God help me if there's no great reward. <laughs> but anyway, rejection. So yeah, so I think I'm going to end it there. Thanks so much for listening. I know my story was all over the place. And... Um, Thanks so much for asking me to share this meeting. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.